Um, so I submitted this article back in, uh, back in May, and uh, I think the day later, I was listening to the radio, I was listening to NPR, and they said, you know, this summer, if you want a cool, refreshing beverage, why not grab a can of America? <laughs> and I thought, this is perfect, because this is exactly what I was just writing about, this is exactly what I've been thinking about, which is the usage of the word America, not in the case of beer, that is, uh, in the case of politicians, specifically American presidents, and how they often will say America. Um, so we have some examples, some early favorites, such as uh, James Madison, who talks about the American people facing it with undaunted spirit. Uh, this being, of course, the, uh, the British, I think, during the War of 1812. Uh, and then Polk, uh, a couple of years later, is talking about this American principle of self-government. Uh, again, you know, kind of contrasting against the British and the French. So back then, they weren't a big fan of, uh, of Europe as much. Uh, Polk also wasn't a big fan of uh, Mexico either. But um, even, even more recently, we have some great quotes, such as you know, Roosevelt talking about his social programs you know, that come from the American people. We have uh, Eisenhower now, no longer is the British, now he doesn't like the communists, right? And he's talking about how American freedom is threatened. So this political rhetoric has gone through the entire uh, history of the country. Um, so it made me think to myself, well, we have another new president coming up in the United States. Um, so what are the odds, or I should say, yeah, what are the odds that the next president says the word America? Well, that's not a very precise question at all. That's terrible. Um, so let's try to be more precise about this. Um, what are the odds that a uniformly randomly selected word from the 2017 State of the Union address is America? And that's something we can actually quantify um, and look at the historical data. Um, so what's the State of the Union? Well, back to the very beginning of the country, it was written into the Constitution um, that from time to time, the uh, sitting president would give to Congress information about the State of the Union, um, and which goes all the way back to uh, Washington there. Um, and then furthermore, this is, so we have a brief history of this. Um, it started off as an address, again, by Washington in 1790. Um, but very quickly, it changed to written reports, which sort of changed the data a little bit, um, because Jefferson thought, you know, well, giving a speech to Congress sounds made much too like regal, much too much like a monarch. We don't want to do that. So we'll just do a written report and send it to Congress. And that continued uh, through the entire 19th century uh, until Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. Um, but then all of a sudden the media started to change, the media in which we could um, experience the speech. You know, we had radio broadcasts with Coolidge. We had uh, Truman doing a TV broadcast. By the time Johnson came around, suddenly it's in the evening in prime time. Uh, and with President Bush just more recently, we now have internet webcasts. So people around the world can watch the, uh, the President of the United States give this speech on the state of the country, the State of the Union. Um, which makes it a very interesting corpus of uh, data, right? Comprised of 227 years. Uh, 42 of the 44 presidents have had a chance to um, contribute to this. Uh, two didn't quite make it long enough. Uh, we have over uh, 1.75 million words, some of which are written reports. So, and I should put a little plug in here from this wonderful website uh, created here, this American Presidency Project that has this data as well as many more uh, writings and speeches given by presidents throughout their history. Um, so I was just playing around with this data and I thought, you know, what would, uh, what if I were looking for just common substrings? Let's say we want to do something like a Huffman encoding. We want to say, well, what would, what are the most common substrings? Well, for the first, you know, so many years, up until about 1980, 90, about 95% of the time, the most common substring was of the, with two spaces. That, that's, that's really boring. Um, in the, the, the most recent 36 years, it was America. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, let's see if we, uh, this is an interesting pattern here. Um, so what are the odds? Let's say we actually want to go to the, uh, look at the data and how it's changed over the years. Because right, we have 42 presidents worth of data here. We can calculate the historical odds just by counting the number of Americas here um, and dividing by the number of other words. The way I always think of odds is if I'm making a bet on this, right, it's going to be the probability of winning over the probability of losing or the payoff. If I bet my one dollar or one pound on, say, I don't know, um, McKinley saying America, well, this is the would be the approximate payoff for it to be a fair bet. Um, and you know, early on, it's quite a rare usage, but then suddenly with uh, Reagan and President Obama, 
we have, you know, the odds are now about 100 to 1 that they're going to, that a randomly chosen word is going to be America. Um, <laughs> leading to more than 1% of the speech in some cases being uh, America. Um, right, so how do we model this, right? We have the historic data, 42 data points. We're going to use a logistic regression, um, which is going to give us uh, here the log bar expected odds. Um, if you're not familiar with logistic regression, it's sort of regression in some sense, I think of like regression as usual, though on the, instead of having our, our normal distribution as the response, we have this log of the expected odds. Uh, plugging this data into R, we can calculate our rate parameter here, beta, beta hat that is, um, which is going to be the parameter that we're really interested in. Because this is going to tell us exactly how fast this increases, which means that with our confidence interval here, we get about a 7 to 10% increase in the odd with each subsequent precedent. Um, meaning, if we consider this almost like an investment, like a compound interest or something, our, uh, the odds are actually being cut in half every 8 to 10 precedents, um, which allows us then to predict. Um, furthermore, um, what we believe the odds should be uh, for the, our, our uh, let's say, POTUS number 45 being somewhere between 102 and 67 to 1. Um, and uh, this equivalently, if we switch back to the frequency domain, means about one to one and a half percent of the entire words of the speech are going to be America. <laughs> I should say America or American um, equivalent, but. Right, so let's look at the data on the plot. This is just wonderful here. We have all of our presidents, or at least 42 of the 44, um, lined up here. The blue curve here is, our, uh, is the logistic progression, the, the best fit here. The red dotted lines were a 95% um, uh, bootstrap interval here um, from the data. Now, when we look at this, you might want to ask some further questions, do some further analysis, and just say, well, you know, are there some outliers here? Because, you know, Madison Taylor and Nixon look a little bit high, Truman looks a little bit low, um, but there is a, um, I guess, uh, some subtleties, right, to the logistic regression, which is that our, uh, our variance is not going to be constant as we move across, since it's, uh, I guess, looking at the binomial distribution, we know that the variance will change. So if I standardize the, uh, the residuals here, we get something that looks like this, right? So now, most of the presidents are aligned fairly close to this, uh, this line here. We have Taylor up there on near our unadjusted 95% confidence interval. But if then we subsequently decide to do our Bonferroni correction, assume, taking into account the fact that I did 42 tests here, we sort of bump up this, uh, adjusted, this interval to our adjusted 95% uh, threshold, uh, and then there's only one precedent who really uh, stands above the rest, which is our, uh, you know, one of the favorites, James Madison, right, who wins the award here for most American president, <laughs> uh, with such wonderful quotes as, you know, in an instance in which skill and braver bravery were more particularly tried with those of the enemy, the American flag had an auspicious triumph. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> he also goes on to talk about, you know, the triumph, you know, the great, the, uh, the, the power of the American Navy and the plight of the American prisoners of war. Um, and in some sense, now I'm, I'm not a historian and I don't claim to offer, you know, a lot of historical insight, but uh, James Madison was really the first president, wartime president. I mean, there were skirmishes, there were issues in the, uh, uh, before, but, uh, you know, the War of 1812 comes along and suddenly the country's being invaded and there's massive naval, naval battles, and uh, so it kind of makes sense that suddenly this rhetoric appears of uh, trying to unite. Um, so where does that leave us now, right, with um, our uh, uh, the upcoming election? Well, we have one candidate, uh, <laughs> Ms. Hillary Clinton here, um, from the, uh, so this is from her Democratic National Convention speech, where she talks about, you know, um, America's destiny, and, you know, America will be greater than ever. Um, on the other side, Donald Trump, <laughs> <laughs> with, who ended his speech with this uh, wonderful repetition here of America will be strong and proud again and safe again, and of course, apparently America will be great again. Um, so it was kind of interesting to use this data. So I, just to do a quick, quick look at this, so the um, right in. Um, in July, the, both parties had their, um, their conventions, the national conventions, um, and then they gave each party's uh, nominee gave these speeches. So I thought, well, okay, this isn't exactly a State of the Union address, but let's see uh, how they line up. So here's what I did was I looked at common frequency. Let's say we're doing, uh, we're doing frequency analysis of English language characters. If America were the 27th letter of the alphabet, where would it fall in? <laughs> 
Um, so, for example, with President Obama, we have America coming in at just over 1%. Um, with President, or I should say with candidate, um, uh, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, um, she's a little bit lower at uh, uh, 0.78. And uh, Trump here is a little bit higher, coming in at 1.11%. Uh, at least from their um, convention speeches. Uh, so first of all, I just, I mean, even just ignoring the uh, the two candidates, I love the fact that President Obama, in some senses, has using America more frequently than the letters Z, Q, X, J, K, and V. Um, <laughs> and furthermore, I like to think the fact that, you know, in another couple of years, we might be up here to use. Now, use was not a precedent. Use is, refers to Langston Hughes, the poet, who wrote the poem, Let America Be America Again. <laughs> uh, and that is the frequency of America in that poem. So you can just imagine how we will eventually get to the point where um, uh, America is just constantly said by, uh, by the uh, politicians if we continue on this path. Um, looking, at the, uh, looking at the plot now, there are new, two new data points. We have the, this, which is um, a little frightening in some sense, uh, depending upon your political views. <laughs> now, I, I, I say I would not claim that uh, I did any, any sort of analysis to say if the amount of times a candidate has said America will predict whether or not he or she will win the, uh, uh, the election. Um, but right now, I'm thinking that uh, I think that uh, Miss Clinton might want to start uh, saying America a little bit more often if she wants to <laughs> that, that wonderful blue line there. Um, so with that, just to wrap up, um, I want to say, so this is, this is sort of the point, right? It's, uh, you know, America, the politicians, you know, there are people who are meant to speak, right? They, they speak for a living, and they use this powerful rhetoric. They talk a lot. <laughs> I mean, and the question is, is, is will, will you saying all these, 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 using this rhetoric, will it continue to be, have power to it? Will it continue to unite a country? Will it continue to move people? Or is it going to just turn into some silly cliche that's overused um, over and over again? Um, so with that, I want to say, Madam Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering, would it be interesting as a follow-up to this study to look at the um, nomination acceptance speeches of losing candidates over that same period? <laughs> well, maybe, it, maybe the data is harder to find, but you know, it's whether you can use this information for predicting the outcome of the election. It, it could definitely be interesting. Um, again, the data set that I had was a wonderful <laughs> data set, but it was specifically geared towards presidents while they were also in office. Mm -hmm. um, so there are things like inaugural addresses, State of the Union's various writings, um, fireside chats, and all these wonderful historical pieces of tidbits and whatnot. Um, but yeah, perhaps I, that, that's why I sort of, you know, of course, showed the last slide with a little bit of a jest. But uh, it might be interesting to actually try to do some predictive uh, work there. So, so looking at the, the curve of the, the usage of the word America, it seems quite alarming. At what point have been hit the American singularity, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wonder, because I mean, now, now I, I wouldn't play now. Granted, you know, we, you know, we're stressed. We don't want to extrapolate too far, but if we, if we indulge ourselves a little bit, then you can just imagine some some future president just getting up there and saying "America" for in like sixty minutes, and that just sounds kind of crazy. Um, but I mean, you realize when you watch a State of the Union address just how often they say the word "America." Followed by applause, and applause, and then you know something else. <laughs> there, <laughs> applause. So, who knows? I, I we haven't hit the plateau yet. I, I don't. I assume that we're not going to continue in this trajectory. But uh, who knows? <laughs> so related to that, is, is this a unique American phenomenon, or oh, that could happen to? <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. That, that would be interesting to do a follow-up study looking at. Uh, I guess here in England with yeah. the prime ministers, or in Canada, um, or just in other places as well. I mean, yeah. So I, again, I'm not sure about that. I just uh, I do notice though that uh, politicians in the in the United States seem to love saying America and the United States and USA and all this. So that's a uh, well, because if they said some other country, they they would be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it probably wouldn't last very long there. Any more questions? 
uh, thus mentioning of the American continent as mentioning America uh, as the United States, the America's continent. No? So that, that's actually a good point because um, I did look at this. I mean, you know, sort of step one, right? When I look at this, we look at the data before actually playing around with the data. Um, and uh, and so what I did was I you know I started reading some of these speeches, not all of them, of course, because there's a lot of a lot of words to read. Um, most of them were specifically used. I mean, especially early on, it was all various adjectives. In some sense, the American Navy, the American farmers, the American whatever. Um, you know, and, and that continued. There were a couple cases, specifically, I remember uh, Woodrow Wilson talked a lot about like pan-Americanism and this idea of trying to, talking about the entire continent, north and south. Um, but, uh, so no, I didn't go through and specifically uh, look for those, but uh, from what I've seen, especially recently, America is the United States of America, which I hate to say, because that actually sounds quite, uh, quite, uh, um, um, I'm not sure, but, but still, it's, a. Uh, at least from the perspective of uh, presidents, when they say America, they're referring to the, to the United States. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you everyone for um, having me today. The title of my talk is How to Mend a Broken Heart with Stem Cells and Discrepancies. So we're going to talk about stem cells in the field of clinical trials for people with cardiovascular disease. So. Let's start with something fun, and you will understand later why we are going to play the discrepancy game. Let me first define what a discrepancy is. So it's two or more reported facts that cannot both be true because they are either logically or mathematically incompatible. Right. So, challenge for the audience. Can anybody spot the discrepancy on this flowchart? Okay, time is up. <laughs> <laughs> patients have appeared after randomization. In the study, they have randomized 41 patients, and they were divided into two groups, 21 patients in the first group, and 21 patients in the control group. So one person has appeared. <laughs> Another attempt, and let me help you because this is a, tab a table of characteristics, phase and characteristics, and there are many, many, many numbers in this table. So let's focus on this row. It's the number of people who have had their LAD, which is one of their um, arteries, artery, uh, involved in an infarct. And we have 49 people in the control group, and 95.7% of them have had their artery involved in an MI. Any mental arithmetic genius? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have fractional patients. 47 out of the 49 patients would represent 95.9, .9, and 46 out of the 49 would represent 93.3. I'm sure that some of you will think, well, this is probably a typo. Well, there are many, actually, uh, zombies in the, in the table. You have 47 <coughs> patients in the other group. Um, what is very frustrating for me is that one cannot add fractions of patients to make living integers. OK, last try. This is, these are two tables coming from the same paper. OK, it's in Spanish. But that doesn't really matter. Let's focus on these two uh, lines, SCA and radius affectados in the two tables. Can anybody spot the discrepancy? The thing on the right is the zero. Say it again? The SCA on the right is 8 plus or minus 10. Yes, but where is the discrepancy? Uh, Yes, you are correct. So to answer your point, a discrepancy for a discrepancy to exist, you need to have two facts at least. Right. So the discrepancy actually comes from the fact that the baseline characteristics change. I mean, 
table one and table three. Let's take radius of hexados, for example. It starts at 40 plus minus 16, and it becomes 47 plus or minus 6. So this is far from a typo. This is true. Because when you do a clinical trial, you want to look at the difference between baseline and after three months in that case. And if you change the baseline, you're going to magnify in the case, in this case, the effects of the of the stem cells. Right. So at Imperial College in London three years ago, we played this discrepancy game. It started very, very casually, and I was part of a group of scientists, and we noticed a few discrepancies here and there in reports from one specific laboratory. We started to dig deeper, and we found 48 reports about these trials, and 200 discrepancies in total. So maybe they were aiming for 200 likes on Facebook. We don't know. But obviously, our curiosity was aroused, and we started hunting, but in a scientific way, uh, for discrepancy. What was the background at the time? There was a lot of interest, and there still is a lot of interest, in stem cells. They are thought, among others, to potentially improve left ventricular function after a heart attack, or be involved in scar size reduction. There is a lot of heterogeneity, and especially at that time, there was a lot of heterogeneity in the results. Meta-analysis were telling us that there was a positive effect, but there were no explanations for the differences in results, for the heterogeneity. And the discrepancies were, had never been explored as an explanatory variable. So that was the objective of our project, just to see if the discrepancies account for the variation in the reported effect size in improvement of the left ventricular function. So I would just like to um, repeat that we're going to look at ejection fraction as outcome and discrepancies as explanatory variable. Ejection fraction, it's a measure that determines how well the heart pumps at each beat. It's expressed as a percentage, and it's a percentage of blood that is in the left ventricle that is pumped out at each beat. And if it is between 55 and 70, it's normal. If it is between 40 and 55, it's below normal. If it is under 40%, you may have um, a problem, a diagnosis of heart failure. And a discrepancy, I've said it already, it's two or more facts that cannot both be true because they are either logically or mathematically incompatible. So, methods and analysis of the project. We looked at PubMed and MBase from inception to April 2013. Eligibility, we were looking for randomized control trials evaluating the effect of stem cells for heart disease on the ejection fraction. And statistical methods, we identified and counted the number of factual discrepancies in the trial report. Then we did uh, some precise weight of regression against effect size, and we did a meta-analysis of the trials that provided sufficient information. So it was very, very tedious. We um, found more than 2,000 reports. After applying our um, exclusion criteria, we looked at 49 reports. This doesn't include the 48 reports that I have mentioned previously, those that have arose our curiosity, because we had published already these uh, discrepancies. No sign of publication bias among the 49 uh, studies we found. No significant asymmetry in the plot. On the horizontal axis, you have the effect size. On the vertical axis, you have the square root of the sample size. The Eggers test, which is a test that allows you to see whether or not there is asymmetry, was non-statistically significant. Main results, 604 discrepancies. On the left-hand side, you have the plot of the number of discrepancies versus the effect size. As you can see, there is a correlation. And now, I'm proud to show you the staircase of shape. <laughs> if you group the discrepancies, um, zero discrepancies, one to 10, 11 to 20, etc., then you see a consistent increase in the, um, in the effect size. 
top three of uh, the discrepancies, just for fun. <laughs> Number three, NYHA class of zero, NYHA is a measure that can go between one and four. <laughs> zero means zero means you are super, super, super dead. <laughs> <laughs> there were women present in early reports. They seem to have become men in later reports. And number one, there were more patients on the plot in the graph than were supposed to be in the study. <laughs> that was very bad. Like they would say, we have 40 patients. Then you count the number of patients on the plot, and you find 54. Because they saved more lives. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so, as I said, it was fun, but it was also scientific. So we um, did a regression. These are the results of uh, univariate uh, regression, outcome effect size, and explanatory variable, the number of discrepancies. In the first row, as you can see, the coefficient is positive, statistically significant. Even in a multivariate model with some other covariates that are used by the Cochrane collaboration, for those who are familiar with that, um, to look at potential bias in a study, the number of discrepancies remain an explanatory variable with a positive coefficient and still <coughs> statistically um, significant. Let's look at the staircase of shame differently. Let's look at uh, a meta-analysis by group of discrepancies. If we look at the trials with no discrepancies, you see that the effect size is centered around zero. If, for example, we look at the number of, of the, if we look at the trials with 11 to 20 discrepancies, you see, first of all, that the confidence interval starts to become very wide, and there is an effect size that is at 4%. Overall, and that was in line with the meta-analysis in the uh, already published in the literature, we find an effect that is around 2.9%, statistically significant. So how can we explain this situation? Of course, we don't know. We have asked um, resolutions with the journals, and these studies were published in the best journals, JAMA and HEM and others. Um, and the situation is, we have reports of stem cell trials that contain discrepancies that seem associated with the effect size. So, pressure for results to match uh, expectations. That might be one of the reasons. Time pressure, we are working under time pressure from time to time. You can make typos or errors, but I don't think this is the case. And then the hand of God. That was very political at the time. What we mean by the hand of God is that in those laboratories where stem cell work, the hand of God might help the people who prepare the stem cells. They might do something they don't know what they're doing, but it works. And because of the nature of these people, they are a bit less careless in the way they prepare their stem cells, they are possibly also careless in the way they prepare their reports. That's why it works, but that's why the reports are full of discrepancies. Now, I hope I have entertained a little bit uh, the audience, but very seriously, when one wants to go from a result that is published in a great journal from a great research team, and it comes from a great university, to an acceptable result, one needs to check for bias, confounding, and chance. Of course, that's standard. But one should also check whether or not it's a lie, or a conspiracy, or an artifact. So, to come back to stem cells, well, the discrepancies, they created a lot of heartache for us. But it is less sure that they contribute to um, cardiac regeneration. So, we published our results in the BMJ, and we were the stem cell fraud group. I was um, the main statistician in that, uh, in that study, if you are interested in finding more details. Um, our work was uh, recognized by the BMJ. We received the UK Research Paper of the Year Award last year. These are only a few of uh, my collaborators. We were more than uh, 12 on the, on the paper. Thank you. Questions? Oh,
not clear to me that in your regression of whatever you were doing, did you control for other component variables? For example, number of horses. Right? You know, number of horses that uh, who write these papers. So it was a regression at the level of the study, if you want. Right. So the effect size was our outcome, yeah. and the number of discrepancies was one of our varieties. So it was not at the individual level of the participant in the study. No, I'm, you know, what I'm thinking about is that one possible explanation is that if a, if a study had lots of people involved, lots of people preparing the papers, it tends to have more discrepancies. Right. Oh, right, I see. So, and, and that could be also an indicator of the study has because there are more people involved. I mean, no, I'm trying to make up some stories, but, oh, right, right. but uh, that probably is the worst one to, to, to look. No, we didn't look at that possible okay. explanatory factor. Okay. For any of these discrepancies, is there any way to um, mend them or fix them? You, you described a couple that sounded like you could um, go, go about a gender change, for example, or uh, whether numbers start and just see whether doing the repairs leads to the effect size being reduced as you expect. Have you done that? And the, the follow-up question to that: What's been the response from these the people who wrote these studies? Have you had any response from them? Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay. Senior author is being sued. Working hard at the moment for the first question. Um, well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't actually try to change basically the facts of the studies to try and see if by changing that we would get closer to a more reasonable uh, effect size estimate, point estimate. So, what grounds are they suing you that it's that defamation or something like that? Yes, yeah, this sort of thing. Yeah. However, you know, we published in an appendix all of the discrepancies, yeah. and in the paper we say, please, if you can explain your discrepancies. Just feel free to contact us and yeah. write answers, comments on the paper. We would be glad to hear why men became women. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a propensity in general for papers with positive results to be published and papers with negative results not to be published? And if so, do you think that is a contributor to, to what, uh, what you observe here? I agree with you, this, this phenomenon has been uh, reported. So there is a differential effect. If you have a positive results, you're more likely to be, to be published. But in our um, study, we also had papers with no uh, effect re reported. So in that case, we could compare, if you want, paper with negative results or no effect of the stem cells with other papers. And we didn't find um, we didn't find an asymmetry, if you want, in the uh, in the papers we had found. However, you're right; there are less papers on the left hand side of zero than on the right hand side of zero. One final question. Right to the back. This is following along with that question. In, in my experience with clinical trials, if there's a significant positive result in an interesting topic, it's not so much that it's preferably published, but that's the problem, but also that it's speedily published. Um, that uh, the publication may be contacted and say, we've got this great new result, we want to get it out as fast as possible. And so the time you need to prepare the analysis is much, much shorter. Have you thought about looking at um, contact date or submission date to uh, publication date, cross-referencing cross it with this data? Yes, that's an excellent point. No, we didn't do that. And <laughs> it would be very interesting to do that in a simple linear regression. And it might come up as uh, an explanatory variable for uh, the discrepancy. Okay. So, thank you very much. So my submission was inspired by a module I studied in my final year at City, which was actually my theory, and also views that Queen Elizabeth reached her 90th year of life. So I wondered, because of the fact that she is effectively the longest reigning British monarch in history, uh, whether how she, um, 
but it, it, it is the same on a global scale and in periods of history as well. So, and also I was interested in seeing whether living in the 21st century for all the conflicts we have and the lack of wars that one of us have to go into, um, whether it's more likely that um, there will be longer reigning monarchs than in the past. So, a quick game, maybe for you. Um, try to guess who out of these reigns for the longest time. <laughs> you may recognise this book from Victoria. This is Louis Wolfie. He reigned for 72 years. And the winner is Pepper II. Um, he was appointed to the throne at the age of six and lived supposedly to 100 years old. So, but we're, we're not sure whether <laughs> that's quite true or not. So my source of information was um, the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it contains information about monarchs from 2700 BC until the present day. Um, while it is a good source for the 2,500 data points. Um, it's not fully complete because it only looks at the bigger regions and um, accounts for monarchs which have contributed to the world of art. Anyway, um, it's a good source, it's reliable because we have some um, first hand information of where the, the birth and the reign of the monarchs came from. So um, it was a good source to use for my data analysis. So the first thing to do, as any statistician, is to plot um, the reign period of every monarch I could find, which was histogram like this. Personally, I was surprised because I was expecting for it to be more bell curved than it is, but so we see an exponential pattern and similarly the book was born around here. There aren't many values um, at the tails, and actually she makes up the top 99.7% of the 2,000 data points, which makes her rule in them as extreme, you might say. So, um, looking to this, we can introduce the field of extreme value theory, which deals exactly with the points that lie at the end of the distribution. Um, extreme value theory is advantageous because it doesn't treat extreme values as outliers as other more classical methods would do and um, it's also more accurate in estimation. So um, again, to describe briefly extreme value theory, um, it has its roots in the 18th century, first noted by um, for Lagrange and Bernoulli, but it was it was formally introduced by Tippett in the mid 20th century, and since then it's been used in the fields of finance, sports science, meteorology. So there are two approaches to EBT. First is log maxima, which takes your data points and splits the time period into equal intervals, and it takes the largest points in every interval and it treats them as extremes. The second approach is the peak over threshold, like here. So here we have to manually pick a threshold and then we say that all the points above the threshold are extreme. With regards to our data, the second approach is more useful because firstly we have all the points that we can use so, for example, if we only had the longest reigning monarch in each, in, each, in each century, we would be restricted to the first plot. But with all the data at hand, it may be interesting to see above what period of reign a monarch is seen as extremely long reign. So, these, both of these, both of these methods find a convergence in the extreme value distributions and the choice of which methods you use lies with the data. So, um, concentrating on the peak over threshold approach, we have our observations, which in our case would be the length of ray. Um, they should be, 
independent and identical distributed. And we need to find or to pick a choice of the threshold U, um, which we would like to use. So um, this threshold follows the cumulative function as we see here. And then we can model the excesses with the following um, CDF at the bottom. So here we have two parameters, the shape, which is the here, and then the scale, which is the sigma. And they just describe how far you stretch or how far you move the distribution along. So according to the data, as I said, um, Queen Elizabeth is only surpassed by seven monarchs out of the whole data set. So pretty sure she is extreme, but we need to do some analysis before we conclude that. And um, we can use all to help us choose the threshold. And it is a residual life plot. So a residual life plot looks like that. And the point where we can set you would be somewhere where we get a break here. I realise that um, choosing it is somewhat subjective. You might think 45, 46, maybe 50. But we can try different values and see what seems more reasonable. So I picked the value 46, and that gave me 72 excesses above the threshold. And then you see that the probability of a monarch reigning for over 72 years is 2.8%, which for Elizabeth looks quite small, but it's still a percentage. And um, from this, we can estimate our shape and scale parameters as they are shown. And we find that the shape parameter isn't significantly different from zero. So this leads us to the excesses following an exponential pattern which is supported by a gamma layer. So what can we do with this? We have our model. We might look into the future and see how long we have to wait until we have a monarch similar to Elizabeth. We can see it's a pretty long while, um, 300 years. <laughs> so we are in, in a good century to live, if you like royal families and <laughs> um, so, so far, we have assumed that all the ages and all the years follow a similar pattern. So it doesn't matter whether a monarch lived 2,000 years ago or is living now. It doesn't matter what region they lived in, what time period. But we might question that, we might say, is this really true? Maybe our data, maybe our model is somewhat skewed and we need to consider possible factors. So in order to do this, we can make the parameters functions of one or more variables and we will see which variables we will, we will include. And then in, in our case, since we got that the shared parameter is not significantly different from zero, we'll concentrate on the um, scale parameter, sigma, instead. So for this part, um, there are fewer data points because I could only get the data from Europe. For this part, I had to do it by hand. And um, acquiring <coughs> birth dates of 2,000 data points, half of which aren't even possibly valid isn't good practice, so I decided to concentrate on Europe. And then here we see a scatter plot of the birth year and the rain period. We see that the, um, the relationship is quite weak, so I wouldn't include it as a covariate into the model. However, the age of the start of rain, which is logical, because if you start earlier, there's more chance you last longer in your brain. Um, there is some relationship, we can see that. And here the correlation is 54%, so 
it's a relatively okay covariant to include. And we find using previous methods that um, the parameters are like we see here. And then now we can model the scale parameter as a function of the vector of ages and some constants. So what are the factors we can consider? Quality of life. We might argue that in the past, life was difficult and medicine wasn't as good as today. So, but how to quantify this? It's very hard to do. Also, the means of exit, in the sense of, um, was a monarch killed? Or did he abdicate? Or did he pass naturally? And also, we might think of whether it would be good to maybe adjust our question of interest. Should we think um, we are interested in the long living monarchs and not the, <coughs> not the long reigning monarchs? Another way we could go is we can adjust the way we pick the threshold. So, for each age group at which the monarch was put to the throne, we might pick a different threshold value. And that's just some possible ways we can go ahead. So thank you. Are there any questions? Are you at the back? Yeah, uh, very nice. It occurs to me that if you want to make an adjustment for changing life expectancy, it's quite a nice problem because with shorter life expectancy, you expect to live shorter, but you also expect to inherit the throne earlier. And it's, is that an obvious, you know, uncontroversial solution to that adjustment? Um, we found that life expectancy over history isn't, hasn't changed that much except for the last 50 years. So from, I think, there is data on Wikipedia from the 13th century until the early 20th century where excluding child mortality, the average age is about the same. So, I mean, yes, but it's, again, it's difficult to quantify. And, um, I even looked at, at separate centuries. So for the 13th century, what was the mean age of going to the throne? What was the mean age of going to the throne at the 17th century? And it just went up and down. So. As a curiosity, what was the only stage in which somebody had seen The only stage? Um, as I said, there was a six-year-old. I think there was someone aged one. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> again, it's, it's hard to verify. Any other questions? I do, just a quick question. Was there any difference between male and female? Because kings and queens in terms of their main things particularly going back into the past. Um, I couldn't actually go that deep because the uh, website only gave you the, the when the monarch went on the throne and when they went off. So you would have to do it manually, unfortunately. But that's a good suggestion. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much. Just to say thank you very much to everybody that who entered. It's always a fun uh, competition to judge. We are running it again next year, so we'll uh, announce the competition in February's issue of the magazine, um, and then roughly the same sort of time scale. We give people a few months to get our call in. So uh, do do tell young statisticians that you know uh, to, to take part. We'd love to love to read their entries next year. But this year's winner, very deserved, is uh, Adam Kasha.